Hi, you guys. <clears throat> Welcome to chapter 14 on speciation. This is an awesome chapter. What's a species? That's how we start out. And in the 1700s, uh, Linnaeus defined a species by what it looked like. So this drawing here is a picture of moths, probably in a museum drawer, where someone's gone out and collected these years ago, probably. And we have, you know, grouped them in form by their looks. And that's one way to start, right? What a species is. And um, each species, we give them a name. And the name is going to combine a broad classification, which is genus. So there's lots within that group that kind of look like that. And then the, the more specific species name which is going to determine just one organism. So for example, the yellow jacket that comes to your picnic table, Vespula vulgaris. So Vespula is sort of a group of the wasps, and vulgaris is of one particular yellow jacket that might come to your table. There's more than one that's around here. So we're going to define a species as a group of living organisms consisting of similar individuals, like these here, capable of exchanging genes or interbreeding. So we have to add that piece to the story. They're capable of interbreeding, of mating and leaving an offspring, a viable offspring. I um, got some pictures of mammals that come to my backyard, which is kind of fun. And it's good to see the name, the genus and species for these guys. And this is how we write it. When we print it, it's going to be in italics always in italics. The first part is going to be with a cap and the second name is not. So Memphitis Memphitis is the the common skunk that we have around here. Skewers Niger is the annoying squirrel that we have and so on and so forth. If we're going to write it by hand then um, we, we don't know how to do italics by hand so we would underline it and this is what it would look like and then that is an international way of recognizing that you're speaking of a species genus and a species okay so these are the guys that come to my backyard i've had the foxes come in recently and that's been really cool these are some of the birds that um that come to my backyard and I was going to get the genus and species of all of them, but it got a little intense, so I left them. And also the termites that should be coming out pretty soon when we get our first rain. There is an excellent video on the description of new species, how we describe new species when we find them. So I want to direct you uh, to that section on Canvas that has those um, external videos. The term speciation is the formation of new species. We know that organisms change over time. And if, for example, we have some organisms here that look very much alike, but they don't, they're geographically isolated, they come from different parts of the world, maybe they don't interbreed, like we said, and maybe they're not the same species. So speciation then is that formation of those new species occurring when some individuals can no longer interbreed with the rest of the group, so that they would then move on to have their own species name. That, however, is not an ideal definition. Why not? Well, we talk about them being able to interbreed, but that doesn't really apply to asexually reproducing organisms like bacteria in this picture. Those are just dividing, so it doesn't really fit for asexually reproducing organisms. We also um, talk about them as being a group of living organisms. Well, what if they're ex extinct? Well, it doesn't work for them either, so we have to think of a different definition. And also, we say that they have the potential to breed, but what if they're just isolated and they never breed, but if you put them together, they would? So see how it gets very complicated to think about what the perfect definition is. Sometimes, as I was saying, organisms will be separated. So there's a spatial pattern. Um, let's say a reproductive 
barrier is going to arise. And in this case here, we have this mountain range. So we have a mountain range, let me get my pen, and um, they're going, it's going to separate these little yellow flowers from the purple flowers. And they are in different locations, and they're different species maybe. Or maybe they're actually in the same location, but they're still different species. So we have names for this. Allopatric speciation is when there is no contact between those populations and they're seemingly geographically isolated. They've got a mountain range or lake, a river, something that's separate, separating them. And therefore, they become separated. They spend so much time changing a little bit on their own that they are no longer the same species. That would be allopatric. Sympatric speciation seems to occur in populations when they seemingly are very close together, but still they somehow change. And then this species will no longer reproduce with a yellow, even though there's a continuous contact between those two populations. That would be sim, same, sympatric species. Allo means different. So allopatric is different. They're in a different location. This is the same picture here showing the population then of all the yellows on one side of this mountain range and all the pink on the other and there is no contact again. So the Galapagos always comes up when we talk about Darwin. And these tortoises diverged into several subspecies on different islands. So somehow they arrived, maybe they came on some sort of current that was happening, and then they ended up on different islands and stayed there. And then they started to look quite different because they adapted to that environment. So we think of those as subspecies, and that gets quite com complicated when you start thinking about, well, they could mingle, but this is a sort of a branch off from one species. And this happens a lot in plants. There's lots of subspecies, subfamilies, um, when you're thinking about plants. There was the sympatric again. They, how is it that they're sharing the same location and yet they're different? Why aren't they mating? So there's many examples of how they can seemingly be very close together, but actually they're not mating. And this is one of those examples of lake in Cameroon, in Africa, where these, these fish and maybe they started out being very similar in the same species. But this lake has a very deep region in the middle and then very shallow location along the edges. So each species specialized in that unique microenvironment. You know, to us, they look like, oh, they're all in the lake. Yeah, but really, they have isolated themselves because some are sticking just to this muddy, shallow part and they really don't encounter the others that are in the deeper location. So those have actually speciated, they've become two separate species, and probably with a common ancestor. They probably had an ancestor that was common to one, to both species, but now they are sympatrically speciated. They are their own species. So we always think of that, common ancestor or common descent. So the title of this slide is the biological classification systems are based on this common descent. That's how we study biology. Were they once, how long ago were they a similar species? So we try and organize all these species into classification systems that reflect that evolutionary history. This is just an example of aloe vera. So you know the, the species, the aloe genus, vera species, is only one of those. But if you go back, in the genus is quite a few, it's about 500. The family, Aspodelaceae, has many more, and in order class, we go up, 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 up into the domain here. And remember, dumb kids playing 
just on freeways get smushed. That's how you're going to remember the order of these to make sure you're going from the most comprehensive to the narrowest. There's the mnemonic. Dumb kids playing cards with chess on freeways get smushed. And you do need to know that order. So I will, I will ask you that on quizzes and on a test. So that mnemonic is a good one. It's great. So we build phylogenetic trees and they depict that evolutionary relationship because we can look at this species like species one and species two and say, okay, they're different, but really they used to be like this. They have a common ancestor, a very recent common ancestor. But if you go back further, they had this common ancestor right and they had this common ancestor so do you see how you can keep going further 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 back until you get to a common ancestor which is actually the common ancestor for all of these species not just one and two so by arranging them in these trees what we can do then is get an idea of okay species one and two are more related to each other than they are to species then more to each other than they are to species three but yet, species three also had a common great-grandfather here, if you want to think of it that way. In modern biology, we talk a lot about a clade, and this is defined as a group of a group, excuse me, of organisms consisting of a common ancestor and all of its descendants. So for example, this outline here is of a clade that in includes the crocodiles, the non-avian dinosaurs, and, and the birds too, that's all together. And yet this is also one clade, just this, because it includes the common ancestor here, right, and all its descendants. But if we include the big one, the bigger one here, then it's got the common ancestor, and all of its descendants. So why do we want that? Because people, biologists study certain clades. They study certain groups of organisms that are grouped together because they're sort of one family. Can't use that word family, but one particular group that all descended from a common ancestor. And biologists argue about this a lot. So they'll say, well, I can see how these two are more related, but not the crocodile. I think the crocodile is more related to the turtle. And then they fight about how these clades should be arranged. Okay, it's something that's pretty contentious. So according to this cladogram, I'm telling you a bird is more closely related to a dinosaur than it is to a crocodile. I've left some of these clickers in for you. Um, I usually do this in the class that's in person, but you can stop your video, think about this for a minute, read it, and then we'll go over the answer. I'm going to move on. A mountain range separates a population of gorillas. After many generations, the gorillas on both sides of the mountain range cannot produce viable fertile offspring. What has happened is... And the answer then would be allopatric, not gorillopatric, species. Do the same thing. Turn your, pause your video, think about it, and then answer it. How many clades are represented here all together? So this is one clade. They showed us two already. And then I could enlarge this. To include the next one, three. The next one would come here, four, and I have to keep going on, five and six. So the correct answer would have been six. Let me check myself, one, two, three, four, yeah. Again, another clicker that I'd have you pause it, think about it, and then to hear the answer, start the video up again. Which of these is a clade? So 
these are all groups, correct? But per definition, per the definition, it has to be the common ancestor and all of those included. So this, for example, is the common ancestor, but I'm missing something here. Yes, common ancestor, but I have this and I have this, so that's not a clade. So the only one really would be A. Again, another clicker. Do the same. Pause it. What is the most recent common ancestor of species 7, 8, and 9? So we're going here 7, 8, and 9. So we have to come down to 7, 8, and 9, and the most common that would include both 8 and 9 plus the 7 would be B. So we talk a lot about recent common ancestor in biology. Again, another one, clicker 5. Using the phylogenetic tree below is the protista, a clade. Pause it, think about it. Yes or no? And the protista are these, the yellow ones. And the answer is no, because not all the descendants from that common ancestor are included. I avoided all these, and I would have to have included all that for it to be a clade. This is interesting when we thought about all these whales and dolphins, belugas, the gray whale, which was the common ancestor? And uh, still a mystery, but the common ancestor of whales was a land-dwelling organism. And that land-dwelling organism was a carnivore, Bacchocetus. And they have found fossils of this, actually, and we kind of are guessing that it looks like this because of the ear bones and the teeth. And this is kind of how we would organize the groups of whales, porpoises. So the dolphin and the orca, more related to each other than all others, than, than they are the orca than it is to the other whales. The beluga and the porpoise, the gray and the humpback, more related to each other than they are to the other whales. But if you go back, you look that they, you know, they do have, all of them have a common ancestor, but they've become quite different. And then the most um, recent ancestor that's land that lives on land is the hippopotamus so that is the great 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 grandfather of the beluga and the humpback for example you guys have to tell you that this past week i saw whales out over capitola direction very cool we know that the whales actually return to ocean. They were land-dwelling organisms that decided to go back to the ocean. So that's just a cartoon of a fish wanting to grow limbs and be on land and the whale saying, I'm done, I'm going back. So it's return to the real back, back ancestry, which was a water organism before that. Okay, I'm going to stop this here and we'll continue on talking about vestigial, vestigial um, characteristics. Thanks.